India is definitely top five in the world in terms of its uh, local ecosystem of uh, companies that know how to work with space-related hardware components. Where do we stand right now when it comes to all the ancillary partners in the ecosystem? It's all a game of trade-offs. You try to make your resolution go up, the cost goes up. You can't keep the cost low, at the same time keep the specs high, at the same time make sure that you're all getting it done within 12 to 18 months. No one really makes high efficiency solar cells for space application. What is it that sort of made you confident to take that bet? AI will play a significant part in making it easier to build satellites faster, build rockets faster. Do we have the right uh, talent pool in our country? Very, very few people in the world know how to work with hyperspectral. I think the opportunities generally for space tech in India are two types. I'm Shubhangi Mishra from Your Story and welcome to Up Close, a special series where we bring you candid conversations with some of the most exciting founders and change makers shaping India's future. The episode is also a part of our Road to Tech Spark series where we spotlight the stories, ideas and innovations leading up to Your Story's flagship startup tech conference. Today, we're getting up close with Pixel one of India's most exciting space tech companies that's putting the country on the global map with its hyperspectral imaging satellites. Founded in 2019 by Avez Ahmed and Shitij Khandelwal, Pixel has already launched its Firefly satellites that are completely designed and built in-house and is building a full-stack ecosystem that goes from hardware to AI-powered analytics. I am delighted to have with us Avez Ahmed, who's the founder and CEO of Pixel, who's going to take us behind his journey, share what's next for India's space tech sector, and a lot more. Welcome, Avez. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Firstly, I think congratulations are in order. Your first constellation is now complete with the three satellites that just got launched on the 27th of August. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 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 a combination of exciting, nervous, a combination of relief as well. Uh, all those are there in different proportions. This launch, not as much nervousness, thankfully, because we had done a similar launch of three satellites in, in January of 2025. Um, but the excitement is still there. It still feels surreal at times, you know, seeing things that you've, uh, you and the team have worked on uh, take off on basically this controlled explosion uh, candle that's taking off from Earth to space. So for um, anyone who's watching and probably for the ones, for the uninitiated, could you just explain to us very simply what Pixel does? But also more importantly, why should they care? Why should they know what Pixel does? Yeah, so I think in a nutshell, we are, you know, space photographers for the planet. Um, but what we do is we design, build and operate our own constellation of satellites. Uh, these satellites have uh, uh, instruments called hyperspectral cameras on them. Uh, and as the satellites are orbiting the Earth, they capture images and snapshots of what's happening with our planet. Uh, so when the satellites are going over the Amazon rainforest, we take images of the, the rainforest and we can create a time lapse of how the forest has been changing over the previous few months or the previous few years. That tells us if the amount of forest cover is increasing or decreasing, has there been deforestation in a particular area? What is the amount of carbon that is being sequestered? Because you know the Amazon rainforest is called the lungs of our planet for good reason. We can look at the polar ice caps, we can see if they're melting, what is the rate of their melting, You know how have they changed mm -hmm. over the last few months. We can look at uh, borders of various countries and see if someone's mobilizing forces and keep a track of the security of different nations. Uh, we can identify what's happening with crops across the globe, if there's going to be a famine in a certain area, if there's going to be a surplus of yield. Uh, so that's what we do. These satellites are basically uh, CCTVs for the planet, mm. in a sense, which help us build a health monitor um, for planet Earth. Absolutely. And I think all such very, very poignant, relevant use cases, right? But um, we've known, I mean, we, we've all known for a while that we need this data. But I think till hyperspectral imaging sort of came into the picture, which is, I think you can take full credit for sort of bringing that into the buzzword that it is right now. Um, we didn't particularly have that data, right? And you've explained uh, in depth in other interviews and stuff as to how it differs from RGB and multispectral and we have hyperspectral. But I want to understand from you, what is it that sort of made you confident to take that bet? Because you took the bet at a time when no one was talking about it. 
and um, then tell me once you sort of got on the journey what surprised you you know after coming back from the hyperloop competition that we were a part of i just decided to look at what was happening in space and you know while exploring various different things came across hyperspectral and just seemed like there was so much more analysis you could do with ai tools with other kinds of st statistical and algorithmic analysis organizations like nasa and other companies as well have been doing earth imaging mm. hyperspectral just was one of those new things that was being explored and tried around and uh, we happened to kind of be at the right place at the right time to see that okay hyperspectral has been proven that it works it had, it's proven that it works on ground it has been proven that nasa can do it but our challenge was how do you take it and make it commercial how do you make the resolution and mm. data quality better but at the same time do it cheaper and do it faster um the biggest challenge i think just has been uh, you know figuring out uh, uh how to put this camera together because mm. it's all a game of trade offs you try to make your resolution go up the you know cost goes up you can't keep the cost low at the same time keep the specs mm -hmm. high at the same time make sure that you're all getting it done within 12 to 18 mm -hmm. months that you need to get it done with you know we were completely expecting the difficulties that would come with building hardware mm -hmm. uh, because everyone talks about it uh, but one thing that did surprise us also was the software aspect of the the satellite and the camera that also has to be tested quite a bit and could end up being a blocker if you don't don't focus on that absolutely i think the other thing also that stands out with pixel is your full stack approach right that you sort of taken which is now you not only have the satellites that you're sending up in the orbit but you also have your ai powered platform right which is aurora and you also have satellite manufacturing so i want to understand why did you choose to sort of own the entire value chain i think a combination of things one as we have you know we have seen um, over the last 6 years now that things that we control in house get done much faster than things that we are dependent on someone else for because you don't really control the timeline the supply chain for what they are doing right like an external vendor uh, so the more things that you can control yourself with your own team the faster you can move the cheaper the costs will be because the quicker you launch something the quicker you can generate mm -hmm. revenues as well i think that has generally played out over the last 6 years and uh, you know in the last couple of years we have learned from our own experiences that okay we should control as many things as possible like you said one of the reasons why you have this so that you own the supply chain right and um, i think in previous interviews you've spoken about how certain launches have been delayed because of supply chain problems yeah. uh, so because of the vantage point that you have in the sector what do you think where do we stand right now when it comes to all the ancillary partners in the ecosystem yeah. right what is your take on that So I think India is definitely top five in the world in terms of its uh, local ecosystem of uh, companies that know how to work with space-related hardware components. Mm -hmm. uh, you only have a very few like US or France or, or Japan that have similar kinds of uh, uh, supply chain ecosystems, and the reason for that is what ISRO has done, obviously, over the last five decades or so, um, where they've had all of these companies that they have built up uh, in Bangalore, in Hyderabad. uh in ahmedabad and other places where these companies have been providers of space qualified components to isro satellites and isro's rockets now what is happening is we are tapping into that same ecosystem where earlier these industries had one customer isro maybe two isro and drdo mm -hmm. now they have uh, more customers like pixel and other startups like satsure or druva digantra that are coming up who will tap into these same folks right but i think there's still quite a few gaps that do exist here for example no one really makes high efficiency solar cells for space applications in the country right so the cells still have to be imported from mm. three or four organizations in the world that do it uh you still have to uh, procure the high efficiency batteries that are made in uh, you know uh, other southeast asian countries or europe or, or us uh, as well as a few sensors and detectors and a lot of silicon uh level stuff as well so obviously india is working on through the semiconductor mission to get foundries here which will sort of help make it easier for things going on to the satellite as well uh, so i think the opportunities generally for space tech in india are two types one is where you build like a service that you are building in india but providing for the world uh, kind of like what we're doing with hyperspectral satellites and data or there are also massive opportunities to build supplier uh, companies for these companies building satellites and rockets because space is one of those sectors that is of uh, national priority and national strategic concern 
and having local sources so companies don't have to depend on some other country uh, which could end up becoming a problem if there's a geopolitical conflict or things like covid coming into the picture uh, will become very important in the space tech sector right like you already said in, it's so hard to get investment right when you've got in that investment a lot of the money is going to go in your hardware right so then how do you prioritize the software or the technologies that one should be sort of betting on so for any sort of new age uh, you know deep tech or space tech founder that's watching this interview what would you tell you know what are the ai technologies that you are sort of betting on artificial intelligence obviously is seeing a big resurgence over the last 3 4 years ever since sort of chat gpt put out uh, the llm based uh, interface etc um even before you know llm sort of came in we were using quite a bit of computer vision reinforcement learning a bunch of other types of deep learning algorithms that could help analyze the massive amounts of data that is coming down from space and you need to be able to parse through all of that and identify what's going right what's going wrong um now with llms there is a chat based interface as well even uh, our platform aurora you can go in just type in with the search you know text query tell me about what the quality in the city of bangalore over the last 2 years it will automatically it will ask you a few questions it will go then search for the data on its own it will choose which model to run it will give you an output that okay over the last 2 years this is what has changed in these lakes these are more uh, you know contaminated than mm-hmm. other lakes these uh, lakes have seen improvement these lakes have seen reduction in their quality mm-hmm. all of that just with being able to sort of type something and uh, your llm sort of parse through all of it so i think that's one example of many where ai will make these industries that seem like very high tech stuff to common people very accessible to common folks you don't need to have any other skill except knowing sort of how to type stuff and answer stuff and then right. you can get to the insights you want in our case a lot of ai will also be on board the satellites themselves right. uh, you know if the satellite needing to figure out okay i'm taking an image of this volcano uh, analyzing it automatically and beaming down the requisite amount of information to figure out how organizations like us will use ai to design these satellites how we will use ai to make the satellites more autonomous and efficient in space as well as how we use ai to analyze the data that's coming down and that will hold true for rockets that will hold true for robots drones and i think almost every industry could you uh, touch upon a little bit more on the aurora platform what what, what else uh, you know can we expect from it Yeah so I think the Aurora platform is built for two purposes one is for uh, users to come in and search for all the imagery that we will have right it's a very google earth like interface you can zoom into different parts of the world you can type in coordinates you can type in the name of a city it'll take you there and then you can search if we already captured images of the same area and if you have then you you can pay for it add to cart check out like yeah. you would on amazon um or flipkart uh, and uh, beyond that once you have an either an, uh, you know if you don't find an image of your area at the date that you're looking for um you can also task the satellite you can basically say okay in the next two weeks i want these many images of this area and then the command will go to our mission control from where it will go to the satellite and the satellite will take an image and then it will be available or delivered uh, to the user that's requesting a new image of, of a particular area right so i think that's making sure that the data from the satellites is available to whoever wants to access it sort of anywhere very much like google earth beyond that is the insights and analytics generation so we have an internal data analytics team that consistently works on different kinds of models right it takes a lot of uh, training for a model to provide accurate yield prediction you know if you're looking at a particular area of farmland how do you estimate very accurately what the amount of yield will be for a particular type of crop for that you need to identify what crop it is you need to identify soil characteristics we need to fuse that with rainfall data historically as well as rainfall data that year and then you know have an algorithm that combines all of that and says okay this is likely to be the yield with 97% or 98% accuracy that this will be the yield that can be used by government agencies or private organizations to be like okay we need to either increase it or decrease it or it's going sort of well all of that then will be made easier to sort of pass through through a text based interface similar to chat gpt um with you know foundational models running in the back end where someone can just go in and type in and say give me the crop yield for corn in the us for 2024 it'll then figure out everything else and just give you the output and then the user can decide if they want to go and work around with it or they're happy with the report that comes up so um the next few months or years will specifically be about making that um you know text based interface especially smooth so that more and more users can start using our platform while at the same time we will continue to build more and more uh, underlying foundational models both ai based as well as mathematical statistical models that will churn out that output absolutely it also helps because i think a lot of not everyone is as adept at reading hyperspectral data right yeah so i think very few people know how to 
work with hyperspectral data it is not very intuitive you know a normal image on our phone or on our laptop screens is an rgb image three wavelengths and you can see it you can zoom it you can identify it but how do you extract an invisible thing that your eyes can't see you need to be able to write algorithms you need to be able to parse through 150 wavelengths of uh, light that's there so it's it's not like a 2d page like you know, on an image it's basically like a 3d cube that that hyperspectral is so very very few people in the world know how to work with hyperspectral which is where providing an interface where we take care of the headache of building the models the user just worries about choosing the right model that becomes very important so you're right in the sense that like very few people know how to really really extract the the utility out of hyperspectral data i have to ask you about the talent right that we have uh, in our country right now and considering it's been what about 6 years since you passed out from bits right six and a yeah 6 yeah. and a half years since you passed out from bits what is your sort of view about uh, the ai talent or the talent pool that we have currently in our country right for all the things that we want to go ahead and do whether it's more in the hyperspectral space whether it's more launching of satellites and stuff like that do we have the right uh, talent pool in our country so i think the amount of talent is there i do think the amount of ready talent and experienced talent will get you know exhausted probably in the next 5 6 years because there's there's only a limited set of folks that are coming out every year but the amount of you know ancillary talent uh, in other industries like aerospace ev uh, semiconductor space software space is just like too high and and those can be subsumed into the space sector i think the last question just wrapping up our discussion that i want to ask you is uh, you will be speaking at tech sparks 2025 and our theme this year is india 2030 powered by ai right so when you think about 2030 where do you see pixel and where do you see india's uh, space tech sector I think in 2030 we will have uh, at least a couple of rocket companies that can launch uh, payloads from earth to space to orbit and do it reliably and do it regularly uh, the hope is we'll at least have 3 to 4 satellite companies of different kinds imaging companies as well as uh, communication companies providing services from india for india but also for the world basically a lot more success stories and success stories are basically commercially viable entities who are going to survive for many years and thrive for many years with the strength of the revenues that they are getting mm. in from the ecosystem that sort of built up so i think that is the most realistic expectation from 2030 of course we could make up numbers about how much we can export and what the market will be but all of that will be basically a byproduct of having successful companies who can do everything from build local components to integrate satellites and launch them and operate them locally to building entire rockets that can mm. launch stuff locally and then being able to analyze that data right? right so the entire stack and i think we will have successful companies uh, doing really well in sort of all of those aspects by 2030 for sure we have like you know 5 years or so to to get there uh, and uh, of course i think ai will play a significant part in making it easier to build satellites faster build rockets faster analyze data much easier uh, and just generally make us more efficient uh, so i think yeah that's uh, 2030 uh, the world will really you know has been talking about how this will be india century and i think 2030 will be the start of of the world starting to see that okay world beating companies can also come come out from here absolutely on that note uh, thank you so much to all the viewers who joined in today thank you so much avays for being with us it was a lovely conversation likewise thank you for having me